Now we want to pick up and look at his argument on the conceptual level. We want to prove that there are certain a priori synthesizing activities our minds perform on the conceptual level. In other words, certain, necessarily, certain necessary ways in which we must think or conceive as distinct from perceive. Uh, these a priori conceptual forms Kant calls the categories. And so you actually have two terms for space and time which operate on the perceptual level. He doesn't call space and time categories. He calls them forms of sensibility. But the a priori concepts contributed by the understanding he calls the categories. And what we want to know is what is his proof of the existence of categories. Now I'll give you a, a warning in advance. The presentation uh, for the first half this evening is going to be far and away the most abstract and complicated of any lecture uh, in this course. Kant's argument is extraordinarily long, abstract, complicated, uh, technical. I will lead you through a maze of tortuous connections, one step allegedly leading to the next, to the next, etc. If you get upset, console yourself with the thought that we're going into this much technicality strictly because this is the core of his argument and has been enormously influential and I promise not to get this technical again for the remainder of the course. Even so, I may say, <coughs> I and I don't think anyone could present intelligibly his full argument in less than four or five hours, which obviously I can't do here. So I'm going to give myself a much more modest assignment this evening. I'm going to give you an indication, which is going to take us some time in itself, of his method of approach, an indication of the method by which he proceeds to get us at least part way to the categories. Now, to be fair to him at the outset, <coughs> I should say that I'll have to omit points that he regards as crucial to his argument. If you want the full exposition it's given in this two volume, uh, account by Patton that I mentioned last week. In defense of my own procedure, however, I will say simply that the parts I'm leaving out, as far as I'm concerned, don't make his conclusions any more plausible. They merely make it still more bizarre and fantastic than the part I'm going to give you. But in any case, for the record, I say I'm going to give you just an indication of his type of argumentation. Now, in regard to his proof of the category, Kant divides it up into various separate sections. And he had a special penchant for terminology. He uh, always liked to invent complex terminology to designate any particular passage of his writing. Uh, so that I will have to introduce you to some of this terminology simply so you can take notes. Uh, this will also be of benefit at cocktail parties. <laughs> Of the many sections which all together constitute the proof of his categories, two parts in particular will concern us tonight. First, we're going to look at what Kant calls the transcendental deduction of the categories. The transcendental deduction of the categories. I won't bother to explain that particular title. But in general, what he wants to do in this particular argument is prove simply that there must be some categories built into our minds. This section of the argument is going to be very abstract. It will not tell us what the categories are, simply that there must be some. There must be some a priori concepts built into the structure of the mind. In this section, in the transcendental deduction, so-called, he's going to try to prove that categories of some kind are required if we are to be able to have any knowledge at all of anything. In fact, even further, he's going to try to prove that categories of some kind are required if we're to be able to have any experience of anything, any perceptual experience of any kind. In other words, in the transcendental deduction, he is going to he claims to be able to prove that if we didn't have categories, we could have no perceptual experience of any kind. We couldn't perceive people, houses, faces, etc. 
So he's going to entirely reverse Aristotle's view of the relation of percepts and concepts. Aristotle claimed that we start with percepts, they come prior to concepts, and then we form concepts by abstraction from percepts. In the transcendental deduction, Kant tries to prove that certain concepts must come in advance of percepts, and they're what make percepts possible. Now, assuming we could establish that much, that should presumably uh, pique your curiosity, and you'd want to know, well, if there must be some categories, what are they? Which ones in particular do we have? And that section of the critique of pure reason is called the metaphysical deduction of the categories. He attempts to specify what the categories are and give us once and for all an exhaustive inventory. Anyway, when we get to that part, I'll simply give you the list along with a brief indication of how he comes up with it. But the heart of it is the transcendental deduction. All right, take a deep breath and let us start. The basic premise of it, from which everything else follows, he claims, is that human experience is always the experience of wholes. That's with a W, W-H-O-L-E-S. The experience of wholes, which are, however, never given directly to us in sense perception. By a whole, we mean simply a number of elements or fragments united together, put together into one totality. And Kant's basic premise here is that if we attend to what's actually directly given in the process of sense perception, we are never given a whole in any one frame of perception. We're always simply given a series of momentary fragments of experience, each of which lasts for the split second for the instant, and then is replaced by the next, and then the next, and so on. For instance, consider looking at a house, just to give you an example. Now, we all agree we can perceive a house, and of course, so does Kant. But he says, how? If you went by the actual direct given at each instant, all you get is a series of fleeting glimpses of different aspects of the house. To simplify, for instance, first you look at the front, and of course, you can't take the whole sweep in in one shot, so you look at one side of the front and then the other side, and maybe your eye rolls to the cornice and the moldings and the door and the doorbell and the panels on the door and the windows. And each of those succeed each other. You get a quick shot and on to the next and on to the next. And then, of course, you have to go around the side and do the same thing, get a whole bunch of shots of different aspects of one side and the other side and the back and the roof and the chimney and the sidewalk. You get the idea. We get a series of momentary views, each lasting an instant, each rapidly succeeding the next. We get one fragment, then another, then another, etc. We can't take in the whole house in one glance. In terms of our actual experience, we have a stream of momentary data. Yet at the end, we say, and Kant agrees, we saw a whole, namely a house. The question is, how? How can we, as we actually do, apprehend a whole when all we're given is a stream of fragments? Now, I could give you many other examples of these. Let me give you one or two just to show you the uh, widespread applicability of it. Look at my face for a moment. Now, you can take in my face, and that's a whole. But again, Kant would say you're not given the face as a whole in any one split second glance. If you watch yourself perceiving my face and you attend very carefully, you focus, for instance, for one instant on the tip of my nose. And you see only that tip if you just focus on that. You don't get the rest of the face, just the tip of the nose. So what do you do to see the face? Well, you have to dart around mentally. You take a quick glance at the tip of the nose and then at the curve of the lips and then the lines in the forehead, the color of the cheeks and the shape of the ear, etc. You roll back and forth. You get a whole series of fleeting momentary fragments. You don't take in the face as a whole in one shot. Yet we perceive the face as a whole. Or if you want another example, the three knocks I mentioned last time. Remember from the question period. Now that's a whole, a series, in this case an auditory whole. You can take in three knocks and hear them as a whole and say, I heard three. And yet you hear one, and then it's gone. And you hear the next, and then it's gone, and then you hear the next, and then it's gone. 
Now, our question is then, what must our minds have done if this fleeting series of momentary fragments of experience is to yield an apprehension of whole, as we all agree it does? Now, the first thing to note for Kant is that it must have done something. If we simply passively perceived one fleeting fragment, and then it was gone, it just vanished from our consciousness, and then the next, and it was gone, and then the next, and it was gone, etc., we'd never get a hole, we'd never get a house, a face, a series of three knocks, or whichever. Now, uh, the salmon is supposed to be like this. Now, perhaps this is unfair to salmon to use this uh, as a lowly example, but even if the salmon isn't like this, let's imagine just to contrast. The salmon, for instance, is supposed to be such, I don't know how they would establish this, but in any event, just as a pedagogical device, it's supposed to be such that if a salmon hears a knock, by the time the next knock comes, the first one is wiped out completely, and he starts all over from scratch like a newborn salmon, and he hears the next knock, and that's gone, and then he starts over from scratch, and hears the next one. Well, he could never get a hole. He couldn't get the series, or if he was looking at my face, and if there were, as of course, there couldn't be some equivalent of salmon language, he'd look at the tip of the nose and say, yeah. <laughs> and then he'd look at the eyebrow, and by that time, the nose would be gone completely, and he'd say, yeah, and that's all he would do is just have a series. He'd never get a face, you see. He'd have a meaningless play of momentary sensations, each gone when the next one starts. Now, Kant's starting point is, in effect, people aren't like this salmon. We can take in holes, even though we're not given. All we're given in experience is what the salmon is given, the fleeting fragment of the instant. So our minds must do something to this data to yield an awareness of holes. What must it do? Well, obviously, to lead you step by step, it has to engage in an act of synthesis, right? It has to engage in an act of synthesis. It has to put together into a whole all the fragments that are given to it in successive moments. If our minds didn't constantly engage in synthesizing sensory data, binding them together into holes, we'd be like the salmon. What we have to do is take each fragment connect it to the preceding ones and the subsequent ones, so that at the end of all of the series of them, we have them all together in one frame of consciousness, and that's how we apprehend the whole. So to experience the whole, we have to, to take an active, perform an active process of synthesis. Well, what does synthesis require? It's going to be a series of, and what does that require, and what does that require, and so on, and at the very end, we'll get categories. What does synthesis require? Well, obviously, we have to have the ability to retain these successive fragments even when they're no longer being directly perceived. We have to be able to keep them in our memories as we go on to the next fragment. Somehow, we have to be able to remember and keep before our minds the earlier fragments as we go on to the next. If we forgot each preceding one completely, we'd be like the salmon. Each uh, successive fragment would be brand new, we could never get the idea of one knock uh, coming after the other. If the salmon could count, so to speak, it would hear one, and then that would be one again, because it couldn't retain the preceding one, and that would be one again. It would start all over uh, each time. Well, now we ask, how is it that we're able to keep before our minds the fragments from the past that we are no longer experiencing? How can you keep my nose, so to speak? Uh, these are my own crude examples, but uh, it gets very abstract without examples. How can you keep my nose, so to speak, before your mind when you've already moved on to perceiving the lips, or the first strike before your mind when it's no longer there and you've moved on to hearing the second? Kant's answer is we have to reproduce in our imaginations in the form of an image, the earlier elements of the series. We have to reproduce mentally in the form of an image, the earlier elements of the series. Uh, uh, we have to actively recreate in our mind's eye, so to speak, an image of each of the earlier units as the series progresses and keep those earlier images alive before us as the new ones are coming in. 
until by the time the series is completed, we can put all of them together, all the images of the past that we've reproduced, combine it with the last member of the series, synthesize, and form a whole. So we're this far now. We're going to have an awareness of wholes. We have to actively reproduce in our imaginations the earlier fragments and then combine these fragments in such a way as to get a whole. And now, how are we able to do this? Out of all the fragments that we experience moment by moment, how do we know which ones to reproduce in our imaginations in order to end up with a certain whole? And how do we know how to synthesize them in order to make the appropriate whole? That's the question. Give you an example. You're listening to the three knocks, and suppose right after the second one, somebody sneezes. So you actually hear knock, knock, sneeze, knock. See? That doesn't bother you at all. You're still able to see, uh, to say, I hear three knocks. You don't bother to reproduce the sneeze in your imagination and add it in. You simply say, that's irrelevant. I'm listening to a progression of knocks. And the sneeze is simply irrelevant, so you just let that drop away. You don't bother to reproduce it. Or you're looking at my face, and as your eyes are darting around for a moment, my fingers come over my face like this, and you get, as part of that series, the experience of my fingers on my cheek. But when the time comes for you to put it all together and get a face, you just simply discard that experience of the fingers as irrelevant. You don't build it into my face so that I've got fingers coming out of the face. You say, <clears throat> that's not part of the face series. You see. Obviously, then, in any process of synthesis, we've got some criterion of relevance. We have some knowledge of a rule which tells us of all the fragments that we get pouring in on us, what is relevant and therefore to be reproduced in order to reach any particular whole, and which ones are extraneous to be eliminated, forgotten. We need a rule to guide us to know what to reproduce from the past. And we need a rule for a second reason also, even as apart from the issue of relevance. We need a rule to guide us in performing the synthesis to tell us, in effect, how to put all these disconnected fragments of experience together in order to end up with a house, a face, or whatever. Now, a face, for instance, is a series of elements which are related in a certain way, <coughs> which are put together in a certain way. Now, if you look at a face, you know, obviously, the forehead is on top, and then come the eyes, and one eye is on the left, and one is on the right, and then comes the nose in the center, and the mouth and the chin. You know, they all have the series of elements put together a certain way. Now, you could have taken the same elements which you experienced successively, reproduced only relevant ones, no fingers, etc., and yet theoretically combined them in grotesque ways and never get a face. Put the lips together, you know, so they're cupping under the eyes with the chin growing out of the nose, etc., and have some horrifying monstrosity which wouldn't be a face. And yet we don't do this. No matter what order we experience the fragments, we always put them together in the same order. We know how to synthesize them. In other words, we must have some rule in our mind telling us how to put them together so we'll end up with the appropriate whole. In other words, to reproduce the relevant elements, we need a rule in each case to tell us what to reproduce. And to synthesize them properly, we need a rule in each case to tell us how to synthesize. If the mind didn't have the knowledge of these rules, we never could synthesize. And if we couldn't synthesize the data, then we would never have the awareness of holes, and we'd be back in the case of the salmon. But our premise was that we're not salmon, and so we must therefore have the rule that guide the synthesis. And now all we have to ask is, what sort of rule would give us the knowledge we need? <clears throat> And Kant's answer is, only a concept of the kind of whole we're synthesizing could serve as the rule to guide our synthesizing activity. It's only because we know what a knock is, because we have the concept of knock, 
that when you hear the sneeze, you discard that as irrelevant. You know, well, that doesn't count because it's not a knock. And therefore, it's having the concept knock that gives you the criterion of relevance. Only because you have the concept of face, you know what a face is, that you simply discard your experience of fingers as irrelevant in forming a face. In other words, only a concept of the whole that we are synthesizing could give us the rule as to what's relevant and irrelevant. And the same thing is true for the issue of how to synthesize, how to put the fragments together. Only because we know what a face is, in other words, have the concept of face, do we know in what order and in what relationships to place the elements that make up a face. Only because we know, to take the other example, what a house is. In other words, because we have the concept of house, are we enabled to synthesize the doors, windows, roofs, walls, doorbell, etc., to put them all together in such a way that we get a house at the end, rather than some grotesque nightmare, nightmare, you know, of doorbells coming out of the window, which is down the chimney, which is coming out of the side wall, etc. A concept for Kant is a rule telling us how to combine many fragments into a unified whole. A concept is a rule telling us how to combine many fragments into a unified whole. Or putting it sim more simply, a concept for Kant is a rule guiding synthesis. And if we use his word for what I've been calling many separate fragments, he calls that a manifold. A manifold, simply lots of separate fragments. A concept is a rule telling us how to synthesize a manifold. Direct experience gives us only this manifold of fragments. Our minds create the holes that we perceive by synthesizing that manifold under the guidance of a concept which tells us what we're trying to uh, end up with, what kind of hole we're synthesizing, and therefore how to do it. Now, if you're still with me, we can summarize like this. Wherever there's perception of a whole, there must be synthesis by the mind. Wherever there's synthesis, there must be a concept guiding that synthesis, telling our minds how to perform. And what's the conclusion we derive? Wherever there's a perception of a whole, there must be a concept operating in our minds, guiding the synthesis telling us how to produce that whole. Therefore, the exact opposite of Aristotle's view is true. It's not the case that first we have percepts, and then we go on to form concepts. Kant claims to have established that percepts presuppose concepts. If we didn't have concepts, we'd have no way of knowing how to synthesize the data. If we couldn't synthesize the data, we would simply be back in the position of the famine. The fact that we perceive holes presupposes that we have concepts governing us. That's the, uh, uh, governing the synthesis. That's the first step in the transcendental deduction. We have not yet proved the category, which was our goal. Why not? Well, because all the concepts that we've dealt with so far, like knock, house, face, etc., are empirical concepts, says Kant. And the facts they denote are simply contingent. You know, according to Kant, as we've said, that kind of thing, houses, knocks, etc., are simply contingent. There could very well be a world without houses, without knocks, without people. And therefore, the concepts in those cases are simply contingent concepts. They're not necessary. And therefore, they couldn't be contributed by the mind a priori. The mind only contributes a priori something which is necessary, remember. So what we want to find are necessary concepts, concepts inherent in the mind, concepts which must govern all the mind's activities no matter what. In other words, we want the categories. How would we get them? Well, now I remind you of the point we made earlier. Even though most of what we perceive is contingent, simply happens to be the case, certain forms of perception are absolutely necessary. 
namely space and time. We must perceive spatially and temporally. No matter what the content that we perceive, it must be spread out in time and let's say also space. Now, up to now, we've spoken as though space and time are contributed exclusively by the sensibility, by the faculty of perception. But what if we could now prove that certain concepts were necessary in order to perceive spatially and temporally? What if we could prove that the very experience of space and time itself presupposed the operation of certain concepts? that if we didn't have certain concepts guiding our mind's activities, we could never perceive spatially or temporally. Well, if we could prove that, if we could, then we could say that the concepts in question, the ones that are required to enable us to perceive space and time, those concepts would have to be absolutely necessary because space and time, as we know, are absolutely necessary, at least to us. If space and time are necessary, and that we claim to have proof, and if they require and presuppose the operation of certain concepts, then those concepts must be necessary. And of course, if a concept is necessary, it has to be non-empirical, because we can't get necessity from experience, it must be a priori, must be contributed by the structure of the mind, and a concept contributed by the structure of the mind is a category. So all we have to ask now is, well, why would a concept be required to perceive spatially and temporally? Well, we know, if you recall and can retain this, we know that a concept is a rule guiding synthesis, remember? And that wherever there is synthesis, there must be a concept telling us how to perform the synthesis. So, if only we could show that the experience of space and time requires us to perform a synthesis, that would prove that it requires one or more concepts, and then those concepts have to be necessary since space and time is necessary. So now we ask, I'm getting near the end in case you wonder, but we're almost there. Does the experience of space and time require an act of synthesis on the part of the mind? Because if it does, we know already from the house space type examples, wherever there's synthesis, that requires a concept guiding and governing the synthesis. Does the experience of space and time require acts of synthesis on our part? To which Kant's answer is yes, clearly. It does. Any experience of space and time, he says, is the experience of a whole, in the sense that we used that earlier. And yet, it's not directly given to us as a whole, merely a series of fleeting successive fragments. So if we're to be aware of the whole, we have to reproduce the earlier fragments and synthesize them with the later ones in order to give us the awareness of the whole. Take any unit of time you want, because his argument he claims would work whether you took a minute, an hour, a day, a year, etc. Now you can be aware of that stretch of time, of a minute, an hour, a day, a year. But you couldn't be aware of things like that. If you couldn't, then you couldn't perceive temporally at all. That's the meaning of being able to perceive temporally. You can be aware of a stretch of time. Yet in each split second, says Kant, we're only given that split second. In direct experience, we only get now, and then it's gone, and now, now, now. We get a series of split seconds. If we were like the, sec uh, like the salmon, each of those split seconds would vanish. And by the time we got to the next split second, the preceding one would have completely been obliterated in our mind. We'd never be aware of the passing of time. We'd never be aware of a stretch of time, of a temporal progression. In other words, we'd never be aware of time. How is it that we can be aware, then, of a stretch of time? Only if we reproduce the earlier moments of any particular temporal stretch, even after they're no longer confronting us. We have to reproduce all the earlier moments and synthesize them with the present ones in order to end up with an awareness of a stretch of time. 
whether a minute, an hour, whatever it happens to be. In other words, the experience of any unit of time requires an act of synthesis on the mind's part. The manifold of temporal data, as he would put it, has to be reproduced and combined to yield an awareness of that unit of time. And the same is true of space, I may add. You can't, for instance, take a mile in. In one glance, you successively get a little bit of distance and another and then another, and you have to retain the previous bits as your eye goes across the mile, and that means you have to, according to him, reproduce them in your imagination, keep them all before the mind's eye, and then synthesize them into a mile, and the same would be true of an inch or a light year, whatever it happens to be. So the perception of any stretch of space or of time requires an act of synthesis on the part of the mind. But we know, I tried to emphasize, although to be sure I said it very rapidly, but nevertheless, wherever there is synthesis, there must be a, <coughs> a concept guiding that synthesis, telling our minds how to perform it. Else, remember, we wouldn't know how to reproduce, what to reproduce, how to synthesize. Remember the case of the house. So we have this situation. The experience of space and time requires synthesis. That means it requires concepts to guide the synthesis. And these concepts must then be absolutely necessary, because without them, we couldn't engage in the synthesis that gives us space and time. But space and time, we already proved, is absolutely necessary. And therefore, the concepts that it requires must be necessary. And a concept, if it's necessary, can't come from experience. It must be a priori built into the mind structure. And therefore, there must be a priori concepts that the mind brings with it by its very nature, that's built into the mind. And therefore, there must be categories. Q, E, D. Now, that is undoubtedly the fastest presentation uh, of uh, at least one portion of the transcendental deduction on record, and even that was 35 minutes. A category, to summarize it, is for Kant an a priori rule built into the mind, instructing it in effect how to synthesize the spatio-temporal manifolds <coughs> into holes, and thereby making possible our perception of a spatio-temporal world. Without the categories, we couldn't perceive spatially or temporally. But we must perceive spatially and temporally, therefore we must have categories. Now that is the essence of the transcendental deduction. Now, to be fair, I want to utter three unintelligible sentences, just to be fair. I trust that it has not been unintelligible up to now. You may think that this is incredibly complicated, but the fact is I've only given you half the transcendental deduction. There's an entire section which I omitted. So I'll merely indicate, without any attempt to make this very clear, the type of thing he goes on to try to do, and if you're intrigued by this much, you can go on and get the rest. So far, he claims to have proved that the experience of space and time requires categories. But then, of course, the question could still be, how do you know the categories will continue in operation? How do you know they're really necessary and therefore reliable? That's a question that many of you asked in uh, the question period last week. Well, in order to do that, Kant tries to hook the categories to, to still something else, which, of course, he gives uh, one of his typical names to. He selects a certain feature of human consciousness. What it is is here irrelevant. Let's just call it X, because I'm just indicating the type of thing he does. His actual name for it, if you care, is the transcendental unity of apperception. But we can just call it X for here. There's a certain feature of human consciousness he claims to have discovered, which is such that it is absolutely intrinsically necessary. And he claims to be able to show that you couldn't possibly have human consciousness without this X feature. And 
He claims to show that this X feature, because he doesn't call it X, I'm calling it X because it's too long to say transcendental unity of apperception, but he claims to show not only is this X inherently necessary, but it requires the categories in order to exist. And therefore, it necessitates the category as long as it's there, and it must be there, and therefore, all is well, you see. So, uh, we spelled the whole thing out. His whole argument has these stages. Space and time require the categories. The categories are required by X. X is absolutely unavoidable for a human consciousness, and therefore, the categories are intrinsically necessary. And you can be guaranteed they'll operate as long as X goes on and X is assured. Now you see why he would regard this as crucial, uh, because that's the X on which it, uh, his finale depends. I'm not presenting it, however, partly because it's much longer and more involved than the part I already gave you, and partly because I do not, in fact, myself think it adds anything more convincing to what I've already said. As I said earlier, I merely want to give you an indication of his an, uh, approach and type of argumentation, and that I think you have already got. If you're interested in the transcendental unity of apperception, you are free to look it up, or you can ask in the question period, and I'll do what I can then. Well, if you understand by concept anything like what Aristotle or uh, objectivism understands by concept, namely an integration ultimately of perceptual data. If you understand that by concept, then of course any concept has a content. It has a series of ultimately sense experiences that it stands for and unites. But that is not Kant's concept of a concept. His concept of a concept is simply a rule to guide synthesis. And in the case of the a priori concepts, they are simply, in effect, injunctions to the mind. When you start operating with concepts, always put them together in forms like all S is P, no S is P, some S may be P, etc. Kant does not regard that as content, but simply a statement to the mind of how we should put together concepts. Now, of course, in, in the objectivist usage of concept, even the concepts that make up the categories are concepts, although they're not a priori, and uh, in this sense, there's no such thing as a concept without content, but he would not say that. When one hears three knocks with a sneeze in between, that, uh, that of course was my own example, how does he retain memory of the sneeze if the synthesis discards irrelevancies? Well, he, he retains a memory of the sneeze, but he doesn't include it in that particular synthesis. He doesn't simply discard it. He makes his own synthesis. The sneeze itself has parts. For instance, at minimum, the person says, ah, choo. And he has two parts. So he maybe could perform a little quick synthesis of a choo. He gets the two parts, and that's its own. All I meant is not that he forgets it, but that he doesn't build it into the particular synthesis of the three notes. Could you please clarify this point? I thought you said last week that Kant said that space and time are themselves categories which determine and structure experience. Now we find that they too have preconditions. What then is the status of time and space? No, space and time are not categories. Remember, he divides consciousness up into two levels, perceptual and conceptual. On the perceptual level, we have space and time. They are the a priori contributions, and they're called forms of sensibility. He does not regard those as concepts, but as forms of perceiving. Categories are the name for what's given on the conceptual level. Now, having made that distinction, he proceeds then to go on in the transcendental deduction and say that space and time on the perceptual level couldn't operate if it weren't for the operation of the categories on the conceptual level. And therefore, there isn't the sharp distinction between the two. One depends on the other. But he holds out to the end, you see, that we must perceive in certain ways, and that's the rock on which he validates the existence of the categories. The only way you could say space and time are categories is if you use category in a very loose sense 
now, looser than Kant, to me, any a priori synthesizing form contributed by the mind, regardless of the level. And sometimes in colloquial parlance, if you can think of colloquial parlance in this connection, uh, people call levels categories, but uh, strictly they're not categories. What is the basis of Kant's assertion that we perceive fragments rather than wholes? Also, if we perceive a face as a nose, eyes, ears, etc., is each of these also perceived as fragments, and each fragment as fragments, etc.? Well, that's a good question. What is the basis of his assertion that we perceive fragments rather than wholes? I would say that just is an obvious fact. Uh, it's at least obvious in the case of large holes. Uh, you start off, and you can't take it all in in one glance. And uh, so far as I know, this is actually true, for instance, of the perception of a face. This much is true, that if you simply stare at any one point, you simply get that one point. And that as you perceive, uh, to perceive a face, your eye lobes, your forehead, cheek, lip, I'm just doing it right now, nose, etc. And it does it very rapidly and binds them together. Uh, so I think that simply the premise that we perceive uh, uh, in any given instant, the direct sensation uh, is one aspect, and then another, and then another, is, I think, actually true. The interpretation that he puts on it is, of course, entirely unwarranted, but that would involve criticism of the um, transcendental deduction, which I think I'll wait for uh, uh, next week. Um, as far as uh, how small does the fragment have to get, I don't know what he would say in answer to that. Uh, presumably, insofar as it's extended at all, uh, you could theoretically grasp one aspect without the other, but there's a certain bare minimum of, of what size, I don't know, beyond which you take it in just as one whole, because he does talk about uh, at least as a theoretical projection, the kind of creature who can get a momentary sensation, which must have some extent, some uh, breadth, uh, and therefore, presumably, he believes that there is some tiny unit that you can take in directly. How small that is, I don't know that he knows, that he has ever said. You said that Kant claims that to perceive a whole, one must have a concept of that whole, for instance, face to guide one's synthesis of what one actually observes. How, according to Kant, are such concepts acquired? If they are a priori, how can they deal with data that must be acquired by experience? Now, for example, the parts of a face. I'll tell you this much. In my own judgment, uh, having on the basis of my reading of the critique and the commentaries, I don't think he has any answer in the world to this question. I think that the logical implication of uh, his transcendental deduction is that all concepts have to be in them. Uh, because it seems to me that what he's trying to prove is that percepts, since they involve synthesis, involve a rule which is the concept, and that therefore, in the case of any percept, whether a face, a series of knocks, a house, whatever it happens to be, you'd have to have the concept to have the percept in which case you'd be in the position that all concepts are innate and none would ever are acquired by experience, which is just the position that Plato originally took. And we're born with all concepts. Now, to be accurate, I should say, Kant vigorously denies this. He makes a rigid distinction between a priori concepts, which are the 12 categories, and empirical concepts, which he claims we get from experience. Now, I have asked a number of Kantians engaged in lengthy discussion as to how could it possibly be that he claims we get concepts from experience while simultaneously saying that experience is an experience of wholes and presupposes concepts. How could he possibly maintain that? And uh, I can only report to you this. I have heard many sentences uttered by advocates of Kant that alleged to be an answer to that question. I have never been able to retain one because I have not been able to follow one. And therefore, in my view, this objection is unanswerable. And the whole deduction 
would, if consistently carried out, lead him to the conclusion that all concepts are innate and uh, a priori. I simply report he denies that, and uh, there are Kantians who think he can somehow combine that denial with his view that uh, concept is a rule governing synthesis, which is required for percept. I have the faintest idea how that's possible. So once Kant has derived the various categories and proved they are necessary, why does he have to prove that they will remain reliable? Why does he need the transcendental unity of apperception? Well, let's just say a word about that in conclusion. Well, because the categories, on the basis of the argument I presented, would be necessary only so long as space and time are necessary. Now, what was his, because they were shown to be the necessary conditions of space and time. Now, what was his proof that space and time are necessary? Simply that we could not now imagine a world without space and time. Simply as a brute fact, that's the way we're built. But that still leaves open to the Humean type the question, well, how do you know we'll be built that way tomorrow? So if we hang space and time on the categories, uh, uh, the categories on space and time, then the question just shifts to, but how do you know space and time have to continue just because up to now they're necessary? So we have to find something that in itself is necessary, and then the whole chain will proceed from it. A word about what the transcendental unity of apperception is, just so as not to leave you with an utterly mysterious phrase. It's a way, in effect, of saying self-consciousness. Self-consciousness. To give you just a, a rough clue here. Go back to the process where we're synthesizing the fragments, putting them together. It's not enough to reproduce fragment one, let us say, from the series by the time you get to fragment eight. If you're to know that this is a series you experienced, you have to recognize once you've reproduced that fragment that this image that you've now produced stands for something which you experienced in the past, right? You have to know as you reproduce the fragments, as you form the mental images, ah, this represents something I experienced in the past. In other words, you have to have an enduring awareness that your I goes on. That's a capital I now. Your I, your ego, goes on across time. Because if it didn't, uh, if you didn't have that awareness of yourself con continuing across time, you wouldn't recognize that what you reproduced stood for what you had experienced before. Therefore, another thing required for synthesis is self-consciousness, which he calls apperception unity of self-consciousness. In other words, the same one eye has to endure across time, and you have to know that. So, to perceive requires this self-awareness across time. Now, can we find this self by introspecting? No. Hume claimed to establish that when you introspect, you don't find an eye. You find, uh, simply, a series of uh, experiences that succeed one another, but you never find a self. Therefore, this uh, transcendental unity of apperception is a type of self-consciousness that we can't uh, directly experience. Well, you might say, is it awareness of your noumenal self? No, because that's unknowable. So uh, we're in this problem. We have to somehow know that our I endures across time, but we can't find the I in the phenomenal world, and we can't find the I in the noumenal world, but we have to find an I that goes on across time in order to engage in the synthesis. How could we find this? Now, this part I can't do much with in a minute, but in effect, he says, the only way we could be aware of the enduring I is if we were able to hold all the content together in one frame of awareness. If we could take the past and uh, the present 
fragments and put them all together in one train and hold it there, bind it all together, we would then uh, see uh, that we're the same as we were before because we would see that we put all the fragments together in one uh, frame of consciousness. So the unity of apperception that we require is, uh, requires us to synthesize the data and synthesis requires category. That's a very, very brief indication uh, of how it uh, is supposed to come in. It's supposed to be in itself necessary for any consciousness which synthesizes data, because if it couldn't be aware of itself across time, it couldn't reproduce the past and recognize that what it was reproducing was the same as what it had experienced before, and then it would be back in the case of the salmon.